And, uh, but we've been teaching these because, listen, I am, in the words in the New Testament language, I am a shepherd. And that's what God's placed in my life. He's placed the calling on me to shepherd his people through life. And part of that is not just leading you by, by still waters, but by green pastures. And green pastures means good, healthy eating, okay, spiritually. And growth track is green pastures. The messages that we've been doing are green pastures. They're food for you and I to, to eat from and to grow and to develop. And we've been sharing all of these different ways of why we should do that. And the most important thing that we've talked about is the fact that if this whole rope represents, well, wrap around me, if it represents eternity, that big old long rope represents all of eternity, represents the fact that you are living on this earth for a little while, and then, according to the Bible, there's only two things that live forever. It's not this platform. It's not the vegetables. It's not the fruit. It's not this building. It's not this earth. The only two things that will live forever is the Word of God and the souls of men. And so if you're going to live forever, if that is your forever, the problem is we're focusing on just this existence on earth. We're focusing on the best things we can do for our own selves and our own lives to make it comfortable and to make it good, and we're focusing on that. And most of us are working our tails off to get to this little piece right here, which is retirement. So you're going to spend all of this focused on this when you should be focused on all of this. And so the truth is, if we're doing that, then if I've got only this amount of time to impact all of this, then I need to get over myself. I need to get over being offended. I need to get over being wounded in church. I need to get over all of those things. That, but this is why I don't. Go, I need to get over all that because life is too short. This side of all of this for me to not be growing healthy in as a member of the family of God. There's just no reason. What you do here will absolutely impact the way you live all the way for the rest of your existence. You will live forever. Somewhere, you will live forever. In some way, you will live forever. And so, in doing that, we've talked about it. And last week, I gave you essentials. There were six things that were very important for you and I, if we're going to be a believer, if we're going to be a follower of Christ, if we're going to grow in discipleship and faith of Christ, then there are things that I have to engage in. I gave you those six things last week. You can go online and you can find the message online and listen to that. But this morning, what I want to talk with you about is that not only are there essentials that help us grow, but there are things that the Holy Spirit releases to us that equip us to live this life. We are equipped differently here in North Carolina for the seasons than are the people in Alaska. Okay? They're equipped. We don't sell many uh, sleighs and snowmobiles and, and shovels around here, do we? But they don't sell a lot of rakes and leaf blowers there. Are you with me? As a matter of fact, Tracy just told me this. Uh, uh, she saw it somewhere last night <clears throat> that Alaska, as of yesterday or whenever it is supposed to start, they're entering the 65-day period of no sun. The sun will not shine for 65 days, okay? It will still be daytime, but it will all look like nighttime. And I remember studying in some of that and looking back on some of that, and they said that, that, that people had to really gear themselves up to know that you still got to get up and go to work even though your body's tricked into thinking it's nighttime. And that new people that moved to that part of Alaska 
really, really struggle with that. Well, we don't struggle with that here. We might have cloudy days, but we have sunshine. So we're equipped differently. Well, God has made sure that we are equipped in this broken and sinful and failing world that the body, his family, Scripture says his bride, upon which Jesus will return for one day, is equipped. Now, there's two main elements that equip us, two critical, critical elements, and that's what I want to talk with you about today. What does it mean when we speak of belonging to God's family? What is what does it mean to say, I belong to God's family? You know, throughout the Scriptures, the phrase, body of Christ, is the example most often used to give a true picture of the church worldwide. Okay? Listen to, listen to this, at this Scripture. Now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. God placed humanity in relationship with himself from the beginning. And he wanted us to know that we belong in relationship and community with him. He wanted us to know that we belong in relationship and in community with each other. I just want you to understand something. If you want to understand why there's so much division in our country, division in our world, why there is so much division in every area, the understanding of marriage and the understanding of ideology, the understanding of church and religion, uh, if you want to understand why there is so much division, all you have to do is look at the purpose that God established the body of Christ for, that we would belong. And division seeks to divide and separate people away from what they truly are to belong to. Instead, what you find is, People all over the internet suddenly the last five to seven years want to talk about my tribe and your tribe. Honky tonk. My tribe. This is my group. This is, no. Everybody wants to talk about different races. This is, there ain't but one race. It's called the human race. If you haven't checked the scriptures in a while, there is no black, white, red, yellow. It's one race. But we want to divide everything up. Well, let me just let you understand why that's happening. It's a strategy of the demonic underworld. Military strategists use it all the time. It's called divide and conquer. When God's purpose is about belonging. That's one of the ways he wants to equip us to understand that we belong in community with Him. We belong in relationship with Him. And unfortunately, because of sin, because of its consequences, you can go all the way back to Adam and Eve. You know, that's the first indication you can see the results, the consequences of the demonic strategy of division. Because the Bible says two really distinct things about Adam and Eve. The first thing it says is that they walked with him in the cool of the day. That's a picture of belonging. That's a picture of unity. That's a picture of togetherness. That's a picture of community. But then after sin, the Bible says that they hid from God. And God went looking for them. That's a picture of division. That's a picture of separation. Satan wants us to feel his judgment. His judgment, hell, is a judgment set aside 
for devil and demons. <clears throat> it's not set aside for humans. But Satan wants us, misery loves company. He wants us to feel the separation from God. So when we sin, when sin goes through our lives, it separates us through shame and guilt. It separates us from wanting to walk with Jesus. We don't feel worthy. We don't feel like we can or like he's going to forgive us. And so we do what the Bible says Adam and Eve did. They are our great descendants. We run off and hide. We quit going to church. We stop reading our Bibles. We stop praying except to whine and complain. We stop serving. We stop giving. We, got, we, as the Scripture says, we run off and hide. And this is what hiding looks like. This is the things we do. We pout. We fuel the offense that somebody has done to our lives <clears throat> rather than seek forgiveness, rather than give the forgiveness that we ourselves seek. We seem to always want to judge ourselves by our intention, but we want to judge everybody else by their actions. When the truth is, you judge everybody by their actions, including yourself. And what is happening there is all of a sudden there's this rampant hiding from God. There's this, this I don't belong, I'm not accepted. But Jesus came back to earth so that we didn't stay hid. Jesus came to earth and restored us back into relationship of belonging. And when he went back to heaven, the last thing he shared with his disciples about was that the heavenly Father is going to send one back who can go all throughout the world. It won't be just like me, like Jesus, just staying in one place and being. The Holy Spirit will come. And he will teach you and lead you and guide you into all truth. He will be there to help equip you. He will be there to help bring you back to your place. In other words, the Holy Spirit will come to help us understand our place of belonging in relationship with God. And he'll help us understand our purpose of helping others belong. And so I don't have a particular text, one particular scripture to give you. But I am going to give you more reading assignments. Okay? I am going to give you things to go read. I appreciate the one text and the one email that I got saying, thank you for the reading assignment. It has really helped me. I've been studying and reading it all week long. Well, thanks to that one, they get an A. There may be more of you, you just hadn't told me. That's fine, but it should be all of us. I haven't given you the things I give you to read without reading them to myself, looking at them myself. But I'm going to give you some more reading stuff, and I'm going to give you an understanding of, this, of what we're talking about, the importance of belonging in the body of Christ and belonging to a faith community. That it's one of the ways that God equips us it's one of the ways that God is equipping us to successfully finish this so that all of this is a reaping of things that are good to our lives. And so belonging is one of the ways to help us be equipped to get through this, this peace, this life on earth. And so here's the chunks of Scripture for you. Number one, is that in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, the whole chapter 12 and the whole chapter 13, okay? That's your first reading, but I'm going to give you kind of an outline. The Apostle Paul, who's the guy back then who wrote the letter of Corinthians, in those letters of Corinthians, Paul instructs believers about the body of Christ. In other words, he teaches them, this is what the body of Christ is, and this is what it should be. And in that 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13, he focuses on talking about spiritual gifts. And he focuses on the fact that the Holy Spirit comes and he endows us, he empowers us with spiritual gifts, not for our own gratification and glorification, 
but to be used as a blessing from one family to another family. And so he teaches and uses the example of spiritual gifts. And in chapter 12 and in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul reveals three major characteristics that define the body of Christ. Now, let me just give you a little backstory. Now, the reason why he's going to focus so much attention on defining the body of Christ is because he's writing to a messed up church. There are divisions. There are sections. There are, are, are people who are undermining each other. There's discord. Um, there's despair. This church is one messed up church. Matter of fact, they don't even have a, they don't even have a shepherd. They're so messed up, they're all just doing their own thing in church. And they don't even, aren't, aren't even willing to allow a shepherd to guide them. And so Paul says, you think you're the body of Christ just because you're coming to a building, you're coming to a place, or you're calling yourself Christ followers. You think you're the body of Christ. When in essence, you're not. You're just like the world. And I want to lay out for you what the true body of Christ is supposed to look like. And so in chapters 12 and 13, that's what he's doing. And so let me give you those three major characteristics that define the body that you're to belong to. Number one, in chapter 12, he says that the body of Christ is a unit of many individual parts. The problem so much for Corinthian church and carry it on through history, every church you come to, <clears throat> is that every church <clears throat> tends to think that because we're made up of a bunch of individuals, church ought to be very individual-minded. It ought to be what each of us wants. <clears throat> it ought to be what each of us is about. That's not the case. Paul doesn't say we're a collective of people who everybody gets their way. That's not what Paul says. Paul says we're a group of individual parts that make a unit, that make a unit. That's the first thing he says. The body of Christ is characterized as a unit. Each part is significant, but each part is significant to helping the body as a whole. Each part has its place. Each part has its purpose, but not to itself, to the whole. The second thing that Paul talks about, the second description he gives, he said, if you're really a true body of Christ, then you will have understanding and unity. What does he mean? He goes on to describe it in verses 13 through 26. He lays this out. He says, by understanding, I mean that the body parts must accept and live aware of the significance of belonging together. That each person is important in the body of Christ. He didn't say each saved person. I'm going to rile some of his theology right here. He didn't say each saved person. He said each individual. What does that mean? That means sinners are just as important in the body of Christ as saved people. Because you didn't get saved unless you were a sinner. And the problem is, we don't like sinners to come in smelling, acting, and looking different than us. Saved folks. We're shaved and shined and coloned up. Right? That's my words. I'm shaved and shined and coloned up. Okay? And the problem is, he says there's got to be understanding that the body parts must accept and live aware of the significance of everyone to belong, who, will, who are willing to belong. And then as for unity, he says, oh, this is the standard. This is the standard by which the body should work together. There should not be a bunch of little chiefs and no Indians. There should not be a church segregated by ministries in which they all doing their own thing. There should not be a church in which this group sits over here 
and, and they only come when that pastor preaches, and that group only comes when that pastor preaches, and that group only comes. And there shouldn't be all of that. He says unity is the standard that the body works together. We're striving for unity in everything we do. That's what he's saying. In fact, when he leaves chapter 12 and goes into chapter 13, this is basically what he's saying. That the Bible tells us that we are put together, that we are joined together, that we are built together, that we are heirs together, that we're fitted together, and that we're held together. And you know why all that's important? Because if you go read Revelation, when the trumpet blows, we'll all be called up together. And if you lived your little life here on this earth, in this church, segregated and separated and thinking you're supposed to be about just you, I don't know how you get through liftoff because you're going together, not separate. And so he says that. And then after he lays out those first two, that the body of Christ is a unit and that you should be operating in understanding of one another and in unity with one another, and he says those two things, he goes, now the third characteristic of the body is the whole chapter 13. And that is, that's how love grows. So you've got the unit, you've got understanding and unity, and this is how love grows. If you are a unit, if you have understanding, another word for understanding in the scripture is grace and mercy. If you have grace and mercy for one another and you are striving to live in unity, that means you put your own personal agenda aside. That means you give, you give honor to someone else rather than you take him the seat of honor. If whatever that means, if that means that you're a leader, but now God wants you to serve everyone else, whatever that might mean. He says, if you cultivate that, this is the place where the love of God grows. Now, let me just take a little another side note here and tell you about the love of God. We all talk about the love of God in terms of forgiveness, and he loves me no matter what. But let me just talk to you. The last song we sang, I Speak Jesus, to tear down uh, strongholds and to break, to break down strongholds. Let me just tell you, if you don't have the love of Christ growing in you, you're whistling Dixie. You hear me? You're whistling past a graveyard. You're spitting in a fan because Christ only honors himself to the Lord. And if I'm not wanting to live in understanding and in unity and as a unit in the body of Christ, he actually says it this way, everybody who calls me Lord doesn't enter heaven. So if I'm wanting the power of God's love to work in my life, and I'm wanting the power of God's love to break bondages, and I'm wanting the power of, uh, power of God's love through Jesus to minister to my families, then I've got to be living the kind of life that he does that through. His love is the standard. That means this is the standard that everybody's going to be looking at. How are you carrying it out? How are you expressing it? body grows personally, and if you're not growing more and more in love with Jesus Christ, uh, your love for others isn't going to grow. So personally, we have to do it, and collectively, if we're not growing in love personally, then we will not grow in love collectively. And why is that important? Because chapter 13 tells you, without his love growing in you, what we do will not last. What I do here will impact all of my eternity. And if he says I'm not doing it with any love for Christ, I'm not growing in my love for Christ, that means I'm not growing in my love for my fellow man, then what I'm doing here is going to be wasted it will be of no good. And so in 13, he tells us all of this. And that if we are the body, then all the individual parts work together with their spiritual gifts to help keep the body strong and healthy. Let me give you an example. If you watch any of these shows out in, uh, uh, of these uh, 
shows in Africa and the Serengeti Plains and all these nature shows about the animals, and, and you will see that every, the survival of every species on the plains depends on organization, depends on a unit. From the ants to the wildebeest, the biggest animal, bully animal there, to the, to the lions, to the elephants, there is a belonging innate in them. And that if one wanders off they, and, and is attacked, you watch those big old beasts. One of the most incredible things I've noticed is the, is, is the, the, the water buffalo. When the water buffalo is attacked, now the rest of them, zebras, wildebeest, they run. They, they herd together so that they're great in numbers, and they run together. The incredible thing is that the water buffalo doesn't run until it's absolutely necessary. But I can't believe it is so involved in them. If you'll watch them, what they do is when one's attacked and they get that wounded one away from the lion, they put him in the center and they put their butts together so they're all in a circle and they're all facing out. And those water buffalo, 16, 1800-pound animal full of nothing but muscle, stares down the enemy and never lets the enemy get around behind them because there's all eyes watching all the way around that circle. And they put the weak one in the middle. And they stand their ground to attempt to wear down the lion. What that tells me is two things. One, they understand the sense of belonging. And two, they understand belief. You know, they're just stupid animals. How in the world they got beliefs? If that weak one didn't believe in the strength, the core belief is the strength of that buffalo. He wouldn't be in the middle. So I told you at the beginning that there are two things that we have. There are two things that God uses to grow us, to make through this journey on earth together. One is belonging. And two is believing. Life as a Christian is to be connected to the community of faith in Christ by a sense of belonging. But life as a Christian is also connected to the community of faith in Christ by core beliefs. In other words, we believe these things. If they burn it down around us, we believe these things. We stand our ground on these things. Like the water buffalo. Those are the two things that God says, I'm going to equip you with. And so Jesus comes from heaven to teach us those things. And I'm not going to teach on every one of them. I want to give you one line about them. Because there are core beliefs of this community of faith that impacts our spiritual formation individually and corporately. And this isn't, this isn't a... If you don't believe like Mark Whitfield, you're going to hell. This isn't that. This is, if you reject the things I'm about to share with you, this is what you're standing against. Because God says, you now live in a cursed, sin-cursed, dying world. And it's a rough journey. It's short compared to everything else, but it's a rough journey. And there's an enemy across the desert, the Serengeti desert of your life, who's going to follow you. They talk like that those animals can travel 20 miles and that lions and lionesses will actually just casually follow behind them. And what they'll do is those Lions and lionesses, lionesses will, will follow behind, stay out of sight, and here's what they're doing. They're just lagging behind, staying in sight of their prey, looking for the opportunity to bring you down. Wolves do the same thing. 
Maybe that's my Native American uh, coming out at me, but wolf, a wolf is my favorite animal next to an elephant. Different reasons, but a wolf is that. And a wolf will follow an animal five times larger than it for 30, 40 miles, looking to wear it down in life and looking for opportunity. And so God says, you have an enemy who is just lagging in the shadows of your life. And at every opportunity, he's going to nip at your heels and run. You, you understand, that's, that's an incredible strategy that wolves use to bring down a, a big, huge wolf, uh, a buffalo or a, a moose. Is they come, they, they will tag team, they'll chase this animal for miles, and they'll run up behind it, and they'll just nip it right here. They just nip it and fall back, nip it and fall back, nip it and fall back. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get that animal to bleed. Because if it loses its blood, it weakens and its life is gone. But I just need you to know something. If you lose your blood, your life could be over. Not just physically, but spiritually. We have an enemy who seeks to bring us down individually and corporately. His name is Satan. But the Bible doesn't only give us a sense of the power of belonging. He gives us a sense of belief. And God says, if you can believe, if you coalesce, if you let these be the center of your life, you're empowered and equipped to make it through this journey. Number one, I got to give you these. You would be shocked at the people in churches today who don't believe any of these things I'm about to tell you, but yet they say they're a Christian. Number one is sin. You would be shocked at the people who go to church and just don't believe that there is such thing as sin. There's just mistakes. but that there is no sin. But the reason why people don't want to accept that there is sin is because if you can get everybody to believe that there is no sin, then there is no penalty for sin. There is no consequences for how you live. You can do whatever, live however. So we don't like penalty. We don't like to be corrected. We don't like to have consequences. But the truth is <clears throat> that there is sin in the world. And there is sin in our lives. And the Bible teaches that all humanity is corrupted by the sin nature. Here's you a couple of scripture references you can write down and you can take it home and study it and read it. That's one of our core beliefs. We believe that all humanity wrestles and deals with sin each and every day of our lives. And you either fight it like the, like the water buffalo or you give in to it. And be held in bondage to it. Number two, because there is sin and because every human has fallen short, there is also salvation. And salvation just simply is to be pardoned <coughs> from our sin and its consequences. All humanity is in need of salvation. And the scripture teaches that that only comes through one person, Jesus Christ. Most of the other, if I, I'm trying to think through them all, but I don't know of any other religion that actually professes a need for salvation from sin. They do all kinds of other things that you can work to make your life better, but only Christianity, Judaism, talks about the Messiah who's to come and die and sacrifice. But there is a need for salvation. The third, the third, um, core belief of this church is the work of sanctification. What is sanctification? It sounds like a big word, Pastor Mark. Its bottom line is this. It's the power and presence of the Holy Spirit who works within you through a process of helping you cut away sinful habits, cut away sinful bondages, and grow you in the strength of the power of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. 
There's a couple of things you can read there. But sanctification is the work that the Holy Spirit seeks to do in your life and mine. That's what He wants to do. Fourthly, <clears throat> stewardship. What is that, Pastor Mark? Stewardship is simply that every Christian is sowing, serving, and sharing the gospel. Now, you might not be a person who talks a lot to a lot of people, and, and sharing the gospel might not be your strong suit, but all of a sudden you're serving in a way that is sharing the gospel. I've heard stories of folks who are affluent, very rich folks, and they don't, they're not great public speakers, and, and they don't know how to share gospel one-on-one. That's between them. But they will pump hundreds of thousands of dollars into missions works and into ministries that share the gospel. So stewardship is all about sowing, serving, and sharing. And every believer has to be involved in it. It's according to the Scripture. There's you some I put out to the side. Fifthly, I'm closing. The fifth core belief that God says you need to be aware of for you to be able to sustain yourself if they burn it all down around you <clears throat> is the second coming of Christ. He said, Jesus himself <clears throat> if Jesus lied about this, then everything else he says is a lie. But when he stood on that mount and he looked at all those 120 people standing around there and he said, this is the last thing I'm going to say to you. Go out and make disciples because I'm coming back one day. A mathematician from the book um, Case for Christ by Lee Strobel he goes to some of the leading mathematicians of the world to prove the case for Jesus Christ. And in that book, <clears throat> I can't remember the figures now, but it's crazy. The mathematician talks about all these prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus and about him coming once, much less twice, him being the Messiah. And, come. and, and they walk through the research of showing all of the, the certain prophecies that had come true. And like I said, I can't remember the exact figures, but he said if only five of the prophecies came true, it's a one in a billion chance. And the fact that, and there again, I'm just giving you an example. I don't have the exact figures. It just popped into my head. If there's 30 scriptures, and there's more than that, if there's 30 prophecies about Jesus coming and Jesus returning, the fact that 20 of them have already been fulfilled, he says, is an infinite number of impossibility for that to happen. And yet the evidence is there that it has happened. So if Jesus has come once and fulfilled prophecy, why would I think he's not going to return and fulfill all of them? So God says, <clears throat> the way you survive, the way you focus on the right things of this part of your life is know and believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter what trial, no matter what temptation, no matter what persecution comes, I am returning to take my family home. Lastly, is the sacraments. And we as a church believe there are two sacraments, the Lord's Supper and Baptism. We believe that those are the two sacraments that we are to practice on a regular basis as part of our belief. Those things become testimonies of our hope in the promise of His return and of our trust in the promise that we are saved because we have claimed Romans that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that He is Lord, and he has risen from the dead, and he's the Son of God. You are saved. Stand with me. This is what we believe. <clears throat> so everybody should have a sense of belonging that comes from God. And everybody should be in unity around these core beliefs. 
about Jesus as our Savior. And these are the ways. I'm telling you all this for a reason. This is the way. The Bible teaches. God shows us. He told us. This is the way you you finish this well. You finish life. You do life well. You do life in forgiveness. You do life through sanctification. You do life belonging together. You do these things well, and it will impact eternity like you've never known in a good way. Listen. God has a divine plan to bring us through this sin-trapped world. God has a plan for us to grow in godly ways and in godly wisdom that will produce a harvest of righteousness in us. God has a plan for us to arrive at the destination He wants for us. If we will just be committed and focused on the things I'm sharing with you about Growth Track. We're not the first. There's thousands of churches everywhere. If you understand discipleship, you understand Growth Track. We're going to finish it up next week talking about engagement. We've talked about being Uh, the essentials for you to grow personally. I've talked to you today about being equipped to grow corporately. And now next week we're going to talk about what does it mean to be engaged in a dark, dark, sinful world. Because all of it has an impact on eternity.